Welcome to Lift Your Story Podcast with guest author Jim Flynn. Hi everyone, I am Lorianne. I am that gal from Toronto, Canada, and I'm with... I am that guy. I am Roy Miller from Dallas, Texas. Welcome to our Lift Your Story Podcast. In this episode, we welcome author Jim Flynn. Thank you so much for being with us today. Well, it's my pleasure. So, Jim, you got your start in the financial industry. Yes. Can you tell us a little bit of what you did in the financial industry. Well, when I started, we used to be able to call ourselves stockbrokers, but that <laughs> became outmoded. So we had to become financial advisors. I, I'd like to be in a stockbroker better, but but we weren't allowed to call it. We had to have a fancier title than that. So I became a financial advisor, but I did basically the same thing for 35 years. And and well, I most mostly helped individuals, some uh, larger accounts, with their investments. Well, you saw a lot of changes in that thirty-five years, didn't you? Yeah. Well, <laughs> when I started off, it was uh, you would get commissions. You would call somebody up, say, "Hey, buy a hundred shares of General Motors," and they'd pay you a commission. And then you didn't make any more money on it until you sold it. And if it was the right thing to do to hold on to that forever, you didn't make any more money on it. So there was sort of a built-in conflict of interest. And that evolved into being a fee-based business. So I charged somebody a small fee to handle their account for the year. And that did away with the conflict of interest because you're sitting on the same side of the table as the person. As they made more money, you made more money. And I like that a lot better. And that's yeah. what it's become now. And, and there's all, since I've been gone for, well, three years, let's call it, it's even evolved further on. And there's a lot of blending with, with other things. And, I, and frankly, <laughs> well, I have to tell you, uh, one of my Facebook groups sent out a poll and it said, where's a place that you've been that you don't want to ever visit again? And I said, work. <laughs> <laughs> So, so I'm glad to be gone. I'll tell you my story about how I got gone, which is probably a little different than everybody else's uh, creation story. Look forward to it. Go for it. Well, I was just cruising along in the investment business. And as I used to tell people, they say, how long are you going to work? I said, well, there's not a lot of heavy lifting here. I can, I can be old and still do it. And as you are in this business, you accumulate more and more clients and more and more assets. So I was at the pinnacle of my career, 64 years old, and I was just cruising along and enjoying life. And one day I was out playing golf and the next thing you know, I woke up and there was a doctor shining a light in my eyes. And he said, you have a broken arm, cracked vertebrae, cracked skull, you bit off part of your tongue. Um, it was caused by you having a seizure, which was caused by you having an undiagnosed brain tumor. And you fell off the golf cart onto your head, onto a paid parking lot. So I said to him, yeah, but other than that, how am I doing? <laughs> <laughs> which shows you, and I really did say that, I was pretty proud of myself for having that presence of mind. Um, it shows you my sense of humor and that comes out in my books. And so one thing led to another and I decided to retire. Uh, I went to my boss's boss and said, you know, it's time for me to retire. He said, you don't have to, you could still be a kind of a figurehead and, you know, hang around and meet people, that sort of stuff. I could, because I was on a team of advisors and I said, well, you ever been to a casino or they have some washed up boxer greet people at the door? I don't really want to be that guy. Uh, you know, as I said, if I'm going to be on a bus, I want to be driving the bus. I don't want to be riding on the bus. So I decided I would go be a writer, which is something I always wanted to do. And uh, I had, had, when I was in college, I had to decide, was it going to be a I had done some sports writing enough that I got paid for it. So I had, do I want to be a writer or do I want to go into business? And I took the coward's way out and I, because I didn't want to starve to death and I went into business and 
I had a good job as an interesting job and, and I did well, but during the time I was a financial advisor, I was on the show Jeopardy and I lost. Uh, I'll tell you about that if you want to know, but I wrote an article on the plane on the way home. I started to write an article uh, literally on napkins and envelopes. Here's what it's like to be a contestant on Jeopardy. I had never seen an article like that. So long story short, it became the cover story in the Hartford Current Sunday Magazine. The Hartford Current's the big newspaper in Connecticut. And this is back when newspapers used to have enough money to have a Sunday magazine. And it was very successful. And it was a very, being on Jeopardy and losing is really depressing. But the writing the article and publishing it, I got paid for it. I got phone calls from people I didn't know. I got fan mail. And they all said the same thing. You're a really good writer. You should write some more. You're really naturally funny. You should write more. I had three little kids at the time. They wanted to eat. My wife wouldn't have taken it well if I just said, well, I'm going to go be a writer and just starve to death for the next. So I just put that off until I retired. So I retired. I started to write. And now I've written four. Well, I've published four books. I'm writing my fifth right now. Fantastic. That is really interesting. And so along with being depressing, losing on Jeopardy, is it also a little bit um, humbling? Yeah, you know, what's humbling when you're sitting there, as you probably know that and this was this is back when your man Alex was doing it. Um, uh, as you probably know, they tape five shows in a day. So it's a, it's a really good job being the host of Jeopardy because you work one day a week, you make like $10 million a year. That's pretty good per hour uh, job. But um, so anyhow, as you sit there, we were, I happened to be on the fifth show that day and they have the contestants kind of sequestered. You're, you're in the audience, but you're in a section where nobody can talk to you. It's kind of like jury duty. And as you watched, you know, you don't picture this when you're, watching at home, but you realize everybody there is pretty smart and they think they're going to win. They're, they flew out to California. They're going to go on Jeopardy and win and be a big hero and all that stuff, except every show, two people lose and they don't get anything. And back in my day, you may remember, I got parting gifts. I got rice a So... <laughs> which my secretary thought was great. I gave her a case of rice aroni. But as you're sitting there watching and the people lose, they're allowed to come back and sit with the other contestants, but they don't want to. It's too depressing. So they just, they go out the big fire door, it slams behind them, and they're just gone. That's it. And they tell you, the producer or whoever says, by the way, you can never come on again That because we have too many people who want to get on. We can't have people lost on. So see you later. <laughs> it's very final. And yeah, it is humbling. The humbling part is when you actually get on. Now, you've probably seen this when people get on and they start pressing the buzzer repeatedly because you have to wait until he's done reading the question to hit the buzzer. And if you come in too soon, you lock yourself out. Oh. for maybe a second. Yeah, and you don't see that at home. There's a little light that comes on when you can answer. It's not something you can see at home. So people are jumping the gun. It's kind of like a drag race. So part of it is timing. Um, for example, in Double Jeopardy, I knew of all but two answers. But my timing was off. I felt like a little kid in the back. Oh, I know the answer, teacher. And they're not calling on you. It's That's very... Um, it's flabbergasting. It's a very, you know, I know the answer. Uh, uh the other guy gets the answer. Now, to make it even more humbling, it was a close game. One guy was ahead by four hundred dollars. We were all we all did pretty well, but we had to bet myself and another woman had to bet everything because it was a close game. The guy was ahead, bet all but $400. And they asked this convoluted, kind of a pun sort of a question. I won't go into it. it, it 
it would take your whole podcast to explain it to you. We all got it wrong. Nobody even came close. I didn't even understand what they're talking about until there were about two seconds left. And I figured, oh, they want to know who ran for president in, in 1852. But it just wasn't, they did, didn't ask it that way. So we all got it wrong. The guy won with 400 bucks. So he was the Jeopardy champ with 400 bucks. I would have rather been the Jeopardy champ with 400 bucks than lose because it's pretty depressing losing. And then it's your turn to walk out the fire door and it slams behind you and see you later. That's interesting. What did your coworkers say when you came back to work? Um, well, you, you signed something that um, says you can't tell anybody what happened. But, but they did see you on there, right? No, yeah, but the show was delayed. So it, uh, I think we taped in January. It wasn't on until March. Oh, oh, okay. Yeah, so I mean, I told them, you know, I said I didn't win, you know, but I didn't give them the details. You're, you're not supposed to tell anybody. You, you know, you sign this contract. It's like uh, NDA. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And it's, it's like, it's really thick. <laughs> Here's all the things you can't do. But I don't think they're going to send anybody to jail for telling their wife they lost or anything. But, <laughs> um, you know, we had a party at my house. And, uh, you know, but by, by the time it was on, I'd, gotten over a little bit. It was depressing. It was, yeah. I was always good. I was, you know, everybody said, oh, you should go on Jeopardy. Well, I did. It's hard to get on. You have to go through the tryouts. There's a million people try out and most of them don't get on. Wow. Yeah, I definitely wouldn't. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's, 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 um, it's quite a process. It's a little different now because they do the initial screening online now. They used to have to go someplace. Um, but the good part was I wrote the story. Now, people who write think, well, the world's going to beat a path to your door. I had to fight to get my story into the newspaper. I called the editor of the magazine section, and his secretary said, <laughs> <laughs> said we get 100 unsolicited manuscripts every week. So kind of get lost. I'll give them your name, but, you know don't expect us to call you. Five minutes later, he called. He said, I love Jeopardy. Do you have a rough draft? I lied and said, yes. So that night I sat up typing and it got on because he loved Jeopardy. But there were professional writers that I was competing against to get my space in the paper. And that was a good lesson for me when I started to publish my books on Amazon. It, the world is not waiting for you to publish anything. You have to kind of kick the door open. Yeah, and it's not easy to market them. I mean, a lot of, you know, it's like they say, even for a publisher to get accepted in a publishing house, uh, they said you're more likely to win the lottery than to get accepted. Well, it's it's much harder now because of the consolidation. It's, well, Amazon is the big dog. And when, when Amazon came out, I think there were, um, I'll just use rough numbers. There were 12 major publishers in North America, and now there are five. Wow. So it's even harder now. So you do what's called self-publishing. You write the book, you get it edited, you send it up to Amazon. And what people don't understand is anybody can publish a book on Amazon. Mm -hmm. As I tell people, you could write a list of your favorite license plate numbers and Amazon will publish it, but it doesn't mean anybody will buy it. And so that's when you think, when I did my first book, I thought, well, this book's really fun. I didn't know anything. I, I certainly didn't know anything about book marketing. Oh, everybody will love this. It's funny. I'm going, it'll be a bestseller in two days. And I'll be, and I didn't understand that you could publish a paperback. I thought you just did a Kindle, the, the electronic version. When I came out with it, all the people who told me they'd buy my books didn't know what a Kindle was. Kindles are, Kindles are more, Younger people use the typical Kindle reader is a 38 year old woman. And that's really not my demographic. So I had to figure out you can do a paperback. Amazon does something called print on demand, which in the old days, self publishing meant you went to a publisher, you ordered a thousand books and they cost 10 bucks each. So you paid 10 grand and you had a thousand books and you know, there's stories about people using them as kindling and having a garage full of them and sold two copies. 
That's not the case anymore. I, you know, I have four books. Some days I sell five books and Amazon prints five books that day and sends them out. So there's, you don't have that risk as an author anymore. However, you do have to market your own book. And I'll tell you something else that really surprises people. A thousand new books hit Amazon every day. So you're competing with those thousand people, not only the day you come out, every day you're competing with them, as well as go on Amazon. All the big authors is there, Stephen King, John Grisham, et cetera, et cetera. They're all the Nelson DeMille, all the people are there. So there's, it's a very competitive market and you have to, you have to learn how to market your book, which, which I did learn how to do. You know, when I first did it, I thought, wait, well, hey, I always wanted to write this book. And it's kind of ego gratification. It's very cool to see your book in paperback. But Amazon's smart. That guy didn't get a rocket ship by not knowing how to inspire people. Amazon yeah. sends you your statistics every day. Here's how you're doing versus everybody else in the universe versus everybody in your genre versus, and it gets your competitive juices flowing because say, I know that my book's better than that book. I'm going to find a way to sell it. So my first book, that's what I had to do. I had to, I had to start from kind of behind because the book was already out. I had to figure out here's how you do ads. This is a waste of money. This, this is a good way to do it. And there's an awful lot to learn once you hit the button and send it to Amazon. There's an awful lot. Well, I had a, for example, I had a generic cover. My first book is titled, um, Be Sincere Even When You Don't Mean It. And it just said those words on it. It didn't have a picture or anything. And I thought, you know, I thought, well, it's, yeah, it's really funny and oh, it's going to be a bestseller. The problem with that title is, People thought it was a self-help book, and it isn't. It's a it's a humorous um, memoir, fictional memoir. Well, nobody had any clue of that, and people were buying it and and sending it back because they thought it was they thought it was a self-help book. Well, that doesn't help you much because you actually go backwards in sales when they send the book back. So I had to go out and get a professional cover. Uh, for the book. And then sales went way up because people understood what it was. They could see that it was funny. It, it's a, the process of getting a cover made is interesting all in itself because uh, the world has evolved to service authors. And that's one of the pitfalls because once you publish a book, everybody in the world wants to sell you something. Here's your new cover. I'll be your editor. I'll publicize your book. I'll teach you how to write a book. You could spend about 10 grand a day with these people. So you have to learn to say no to everybody. But the one thing you do want to spend money on is a professional cover. And there are services where you go and you say, here's, here's my budget. Here's what I want. You pick um, other covers that you like that are in your genre and say, I, I want to kind of make it look like this. So, for example, in thrillers, you want to have a dark cover. Uh, you, you don't want to have a sunny cover. It looks like you're going to read it at the beach. You want to have uh, sinister. And, I, and a couple of my books are, are, are thrillers. So I learned to do that. It's, it's, a, it's a really interesting learning experience. It's interesting, too, though, what you said. We learned, uh, we did have um, a young lady who has a publishing company. Um, and she also helps with the self published people to help market them, which yes. is great because that's a, that's a really good niche to be in because if you're self published, you need marketing. But she was also saying on Amazon, you ask to very carefully choose the category you're in. Some of them go to number one, but it's not number one on Amazon. It's number one in that category, but it allows you to say I'm number one seller on Amazon because you are in that category. And there's so many different categories and some of them are a lot less popular than others and if you pick that category you're more likely to get there faster which I found totally interesting because I did not know that I mean I I'm fascinated by and I understand because I've gone through this as well with the buying 50 books and they're all sitting there on my shelf yep um you can but the nice thing is too is in marketing a lot of people Jim and I'm sure you know this you can go to your local bookstores and they're 
more than excited to have a local come in, but you have to purchase some pre-printed ones, but go do book signing. Well, um, local bookstores hate Amazon. If you publish through Amazon, it's the death star to local books. So if you publish through Amazon, they hate you. They will not. But not here in Canada, they don't. They love that there's a local person who's an author and they tell you, bring your books, your printed books, come with them and have them signed. Well, in the U.S., you you can't get near a bookstore if you publish through Amazon. Wow. Yeah. Now, I have done some talks in the libraries similar to what you're saying, Mm -hmm. because they like to have local authors and they're great. And and you sign the books and you feel like a big shot because you're giving autographs. And the problem I had is as soon as my first book hit and I had a talk in the local library, COVID hit. All the talks got canceled. And I was just able to do my first talk about a week ago and they had half capacity. Everybody had a mask on. I got, I took my mask off to talk. It was a little awkward, but it was still fun. Um, so that's the way, that's the way you can do that. Um, but can I ask uh, a question? Have you ever sure. done reverse shoplifting? Uh, I don't know what you mean. Oh, put my book in the store. <laughs> no, that's, that's a good one. That I might want to do that though. That's, <laughs> heard about that. I laughed so hard when I found out. I found out about three years ago about this reverse shoplifting. I was telling my daughter just, in fact, yesterday about it. She goes, what's that? And I, no, my sister. And I told her what it was. She goes, never heard of that before. I go, yeah. So you're actually putting your book next to somebody really popular. Take a picture of it. Post it. Well, that, you know, that's, that's pretty clever. I, you know, I'm, I'm not above doing that. So <laughs> thank you for the suggestion. But to go back to go back to the books. Yeah. My first book was a humor book. So as you're saying, you want to get in the right category because if you're just in with humor books, guess what? You're competing against Jerry Seinfeld. Uh, how do you think I'm going to do against Jerry Seinfeld? <laughs> or, and and, and f- frankly, humor books are really tough to sell if you're not a known person. You know, if you're a comedian, you're a guy in a Tonight Show, those are the guys who sell humor books. If you're Jim Flynn, nobody knows who you are. It's really hard to sell a humor book. My book, though, did sell quite well under the circumstances. Uh, And some professional authors got in touch with me out of the clear blue sky. I said, I really liked your book. You should write more, but you should learn to write a novel. Because if you want to be successful, you have to be in that genre. Because you can write humor books all day long. You're going to sell 500 copies. It can be the greatest humor book. It's very hard to, to climb that wall. You have to be in a different genre. And if you think about, um, so, I learned, so I learned how to write a novel, uh, which we all think we know how to write a novel. There's an old saying, everybody knows what a story is until they sit down to write one. And so I, I, there's a million great sources on how to write a novel and you could spend the rest of your life just learning how to write a novel without doing anything. But I, so I, I, I use pretty much three different sources and interestingly, they all talk about a movie. They don't talk about books as much as, Oh, how about the fugitive? How about, you know, die hard? How about, so if you're writing uh, a novel, and depends on who's teaching, there's, there's something called plot points. There are 15 plot points you want to hit. And basically, it's the Luke Skywalker model of a novel. So you take some innocent kid or fairly innocent person, you put, put him through all these trials and tribulations, and he emerges at the end as a more mature man. And, and also, you have to get the hero in trouble. There has to be Trouble, more trouble, insurmountable trouble, and then somehow the hero triumphs at the end. It sounds formulaic, but if you think about every movie you ever saw that you liked, that's the formula. And I'm not above doing the formula. And it, it's not just true for thrillers. It's romantic comedies. Yeah. The girl saw the guy kissing somebody in the gazebo. Mm-hmm. He didn't realize it was his cousin. Oh. And 
you know, led to this and that and, and then all these troubles and they end up at the end getting together. That's basically the formula for every romantic comedy. But right, people just, still like it. Just want to interject really quickly because I, when I was taking writing, there was one thing and, and, and kudos to you because comedy and humor writing is the most difficult genre of all writing styles. It's a known fact. It's the most difficult one to write. So. Well, you know, that's, the people who, and as I said, I have some fans who are professional writers, and they said to me, most people are not good at writing humor. Even really great writers aren't good at humor. Some of them staple jokes into, they have their hero tell a joke. Uh -huh. But to have humor be part of the story is something I can do. Very and good. they said, they said, keep writing because you, you have that talent keep doing it, it'll catch on eventually. So my second, sure. my second two published books are financial thrillers based on my background in finance. The first one is, and it has, it has the same hero in both. Uh, this guy's name is J.R. Johnson. He's a money manager. His, in the first book, which is called Losing Lola, his client is Lola Madison, the biggest movie star in the world. He suspects that he's going to lose the account to a New York hotshot money manager who he thinks the numbers are too good to be true. There's something wrong with this guy. Of course, Lola doesn't believe him because she thinks he's just jealous. And, well, it turns out that he's right. Something was too good. The numbers are phony. And it's based on Bernie Madoff. The character the character of the bad guy isn't like Bernie Madoff's character, but the, what he did is, is like it because Bernie basically cooked all the numbers, but Bernie was very good at attracting showbiz money. So people had a lot of money who ne weren't necessarily sophisticated at investing. And he got billions and billions of dollars by just making up phony numbers. Um, that's when the action starts in this book. <laughs> After she moves the money, because uh, there's some Russian bad guys who have invested with this guy who now figure out what he's doing, and one thing leads to another. So that's the that's the thriller part. So uh, that book was successful. It sold a lot more copies than my first book because it's a story. People like a story, and even I and the first book does have some fans. But when they talk to me or write to me, they say, oh, I like it because it was funny. And they'll point out this first guy was it's kind of a Walter Mitty thing. He did all these things. It, unlike Walter Mitty, this character really did all the things, allegedly, that are in the book. He was an astronaut. He played in the Super Bowl. He was an astrophysicist. For example, there are astrophysicists who are fans of this book because they said, well, it's the only funny book about astrophysicists. I said, well, now there's a niche category for you. <laughs> Unfortunately, Amazon doesn't have humor astrophysics as a category. I, they'd definitely be number one in that. But, right. but my point is, yeah. people would point out, hey, I like the part where he was an astronaut because this was funny. They, uh -huh. they, they'd talk about this was funny, that was funny. But the people who talk to me about the thrillers talk about the characters. Uh -huh. They say, oh, that's Sierra Quinn. She's really bad. You should kill her off. <laughs> and so they're it's almost like a, uh, a, a what what people watch in the afternoon. What are those called again? Oh, soap oh, operas. Well, yeah, thank you. <laughs> well, yeah, well, it 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 does have a little component of that, except <laughs> none of none of the people on the soap operas are as bad as Sierra Quinn is. <laughs> so she's really bad. So uh, they, they but the point is they talk about the characters like they're real people. Yeah, yeah, uh, they, that's good. That means that they're they're real enough for them to really see them in their own imagination, and I think that's really important. Um, Why? Well, just I quickly, have... I do have to say one of my favorite favorite books that the movie was perfect for was um, To Kill a Mockingbird. I loved that sh that book, and then when yep. they came out with the movie, I could not believe that the characters were almost identical to what I imagined them as. Well, yeah, it's, you know, sometimes the movie is actually better than the book. 
Sometimes, um, not often. But and a lot like, of times, to kill a mockingbird, you really yeah. have to find the right actors and actresses for this one, and they did a phenomenal job. Seriously. Well, To Kill a Mockingbird is what's called literary fiction, and yeah. and I'm doing what's called popular fiction. So, yeah. it's I, I'm just I'm just meaning it to be a story that people will go along. You know, To Kill a Mockingbird has a serious message and all that. Yes. And I'm not, and I don't pretend I'm that kind of serious author. I just want to have an interesting story. No, but I'm but basically, I was, yeah, well, I was just alluding to the fact that when you have a character and somebody can imagine it yep. in their heads, it's very important because some writers, when they write about a character, it's really hard to imagine in your mind what they actually look like, if you know what I'm saying, right? So that's what the descriptive side of it is really important. Well, you know what, if you go to Kill a Mockingbird, which I've studied, he, uh, she rather doesn't really describe the characters that much. You just you just get that picture in your mind, sort of. It isn't like she spends ten pages telling you what Scout looks like. That's she doesn't true. do that. You just draw that picture in your own mind from the action in the book. I mean, yeah. she's a really good writer. I'm not pretending I'm that that I'm in that class. Oh no, I'm just I was just making a <laughs> yeah. <context of> but <laughs> for example. Um, one of the books on writing that professional writers will tell you to read is Stephen King on writing. And, and Stephen King isn't big on describing characters, but directly. He won't say, oh, the guy was six foot three and he had a big note. He doesn't do that. But you get your own picture in a Stephen King book mm -hmm. from, the, from the stuff that goes on. Yeah. And by the way, Stephen King is Anybody who's interested in writing at all should read that book. I'm not a Stephen King fan, uh, but I learned a lot by reading his book. And he he's a fascinating person. You can see what he has a he had kind of a crazy life, yeah. and you can see why he writes some of the stuff he does. But Stephen King is a great lesson for people who are writing, because. I I was just saying, and I want to just throw in too, another yeah. one that's really, really good is a called On Writing Well by, I think, believe it's William Zimmer. Absolutely fantastic book as well um, that I also gave to my daughter because I just think that that's absolutely fantastic. He is, he does write about writing and, and styles and how to really build a character, much like you're talking about. Um, but that's wonderful. Now, uh, so that was your first book. We were running out a little bit of time, but do you want to okay. give us a quick overview of your second one? Okay. Second one was Losing Lola. That was the first financial thriller. Third one is called The Bitcoin Gambit. Okay. Same protagonist, J.R. Johnson. He, he's based out of Austin, Texas. He's managing money. He's a little bored. Bitcoin has emerged. He decides what's the worst that can happen if I just dip my toe into a little Bitcoin investing, guess what? A lot of things start happening. You know, Bitcoin, there's a lot of money floating around Bitcoin. And there was a message, there was a message I have there. People don't trust the government. They don't trust banks. Yet they trust their money to something they don't even know what it is. I have to buy Bitcoin. It's going up. I got to buy it. That's probably not the greatest reason to buy something. And... Um, a lot of very interesting things happened at JR after that. The same Russian bad guys are involved in, in this book as the first one. And the same uh, very bad woman is now working for the Russian bad guys. So, um, very cool. Yeah, cool thing. Interesting. Okay, it's funny. You, you say JR and then you talk about Texas, and I'm thinking, you know, JR Ewing. <laughs> you know, that, that never occurred to me. The people right. mentioned that, that that was not intentional. No. And my nephew, yeah. his name was Jonathan Ross because my my father loved J.R. Ewing, so uh, my sister made sure that he had the initials J.R. <laughs> <laughs> that really that really wasn't intentional. I didn't think about it. People that's pointed cool, out though. afterwards. Yeah. Yeah, uh, no, that's very cool. No, I yeah. I will tell you that since I ended up having brain surgery and that's why I retired from being a financial advisor, I'm not really normal. I can fake being normal, but I still have some issues. Okay. And when I'm writing, one of the things about writing is if you're doing a good job, you have to start living with your characters. They have to become like real people to you. Yeah. I don't want to sound like I'm some artiste or something, but you really have to get involved or you're not doing a good job. 
That's but true. the problem is, as you go on doing that, um, and you have to keep getting the characters in more and more trouble, it becomes pretty intense. Yeah. So I had to back off. I was writing the sequel to the Bitcoin Gambit, and I, it was just too much for me. I had to back off, and I stopped for a month and wrote another book. It's a short little golf book. It's called Hit Your Second Shot First. It's a funny little golf book. It's 100 pages long. It's doing great. And as you say, on Amazon, it has, it's in all these niche categories. Yeah. It was number one in books you can read in less than two hours. It was number one in sports humor. Now, one of my friends said, well, how big of a category is that? I said, I don't know, but it's better to be number one than number 15. So, no, it's, it's done very well. It was a little, it was a kind of a mental rest for me. Now yeah. I'm back to writing the more intense stuff. I can imagine that. And just quickly before uh, Roy is going to kick in here, but okay. uh, I do have to say that what is normal, really? I mean, <laughs> we all have a little bit of crazy in us as far as I'm concerned. <laughs> Some a little bit more than others. That's all. Well, <laughs> as, good as, for a matter, you. as a matter of fact, Sierra Quinn, the bad woman, she used to be a New York detective and she says, Normal is just the arithmetic average of all the abnormal people. Exactly. <laughs> so, Roy? Yeah. So, Jim, how can our listeners reach out to you? Well, uh, the best way is I have a website. It's Jim Flynn 6 sixcom They can sign up for my newsletter. They can email me. Uh, they can see all my books. They can buy my books. Uh, click over to Amazon. Uh, so jimflint6.com. Beautiful. And we will have a link on our uh, website to your, uh, to the, uh, to a book. Um, we'll link it to your main page, but which, uh, which one would, are you right now promoting the most? I would say quickly? hit your second shot first. That has the most, that has the broadest appeal. And I Perfect. say to people, if they want to see what they want to see my sense of humor, it costs five bucks. Yeah. It's less than the Father's Day card they got. And it's definitely more, it's definitely funnier than that. And then at the end, it says, if you like this book, you might want to look at my other books and it lists them. So I'd start with that. Excellent. Thank you so much for being with us here today. Excellent information about book publishing. I'm so glad that you shared that with our listeners. Roy? Yeah, thank you so much. It was a, it was a pleasure to meet you. Well, uh, pleasure's all mine. Thank you very much for having me. Um, Maybe uh, maybe down the road when I come out with the next book, I can come back on. Perfect. <laughs> okay. All right, Jim. Thank you. Okay. Thanks. Mm, Thanks for right. having me. Well, Look forward to seeing your. I'll be posting your uh, posting your podcast. Thank right. you. Thank you very Thanks. much. Okay. Bye bye. Bye. bye.